Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact or donate. In this episode, Neil Cole and I discuss his new book, Viral, the importance of hearing God's voice, what lateral leadership looks like in the church, and much, much more. Uh, Neil has catalyzed and launched the multiplication of organic churches worldwide. He's authored 17 books. It's a fantastic conversation. So let's get to it. Here he is. Neil, thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited to have you on today. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you. Uh, Yeah, I was just reading uh, the preface to your book, uh, Viral, that just came out. And uh, you said that all your your books and your teaching can be summarized into listen to Jesus and do what he says. Um, And I think that's that's vital and that's key. Um, I was teaching a class last night and they wanted to pray for me beforehand. And I, I told them. Uh, the only thing that I want is to hear from Jesus and do what he says. Um, and so what does that look like um, in an everyday life uh, to do that? There's, there's probably two sides to answer that question, Joshua. One is we have to stop functioning with all the ways that prevent us from doing that. Mm. So we typically um, have default ways to go about our lives that make decisions that may appear wise or may appear to be beneficial to oneself, but are not truly listening to God. And, yeah. and those habits are so reinforced in our lives that it takes some time to dislodge them so that we could even, if we did hear his voice, act upon it. Yeah. The, the second Part of it is, uh, I think um, we we have to get better at the skill because in the future, I think we will it will not be uh, possible to accomplish what God wants if we're mm-hmm. not uh, able to turn on a dime and move in a direction that He leads us in, even if it doesn't sit, make sense in the moment. Right. Uh, and and our typical Christianity is just not capable of that right now. Yeah. So um, we're, we're going to have to get better at this skill. Yeah. So so what are the some of the tools that we could use to actually get better at that? And actually, in a ever changing, very quickly changing world, that we could actually hear and obey quickly. Well, it's it's, it's less a skill and more of a relationship. I think. We just have to have an intimacy with this, with with God. Um, there are there's a whole chapter in in the book that is about um, hearing God's voice and how to hear it. Yeah. There's different frequencies you can tune into, and that's nothing new. There's many times that books that have been written on that and lectures on that. The thing is, is um, <laughs> we just we we just have to be more in tune with our Father. Mm. Uh, in relationship. And so at one point in that chapter, I articulate checks to make sure that you're testing if this message is from God or not. But I have to say that every one of those tests, while full of wisdom, are are not perfect. And yeah. the reason why is because this is not a science project where you tick off the boxes and you get the result that you expect. Yeah. This is a relationship with a person. And um, any any kind of approach to hearing God's voice that is mechanical, that's plug and play, that you could do with or without the Holy Spirit is a mistake. Mm. That's yeah. taking us in the, in the wrong direction. It's a tangent that's unhealthy, if not lethal. Mm. So I think we have to just get better at being intimate with God. And I think knowing his voice grows with time. Right. So I use the analogy of my children. When they were babies, I would speak to them and say, don't touch the heater, knowing full well that they don't understand any of that vocabulary or language. (laughs) So I wouldn't just rely upon that. I would also pick up the baby, the the toddler, and remove them. And so that's two forms of communication, verbal, Mm -hmm. which isn't coming across, and Mm nonverbal. Now, 
later you keep using the verbal, they come to understand what it means. So right. it's not useless to speak to them. That's part of the education process process but the nonverbal is very important at that stage as they get older verbal message becomes prominent and the nonverbal you stop picking up your teenager and moving them physically mm-hmm. you just start reasoning with them and showing them uh you know um implications of their decisions yeah but there comes a time when the intimacy grows that i could be a, in a crowded room full of people and my daughter and i see each other's eyes make contact across yeah. the room and she knows what I'm thinking without my saying a word. Mm. And that's not verbal or nonverbal. That's yeah. just intimacy. That's just knowing each other really well. And I think you can grow in your understanding of God's voice, but there is absolutely no better way to know God's voice than to spend a lot of time in the scriptures, which is God's voice. Mm. Um, but I know many people who spend hours every day in God's word and they still don't know how to hear his voice. Mm. So it's not a, it's not a perfect solution. None of the tests are perfect Yeah. Um, because this is a relationship and it's meant to be more than just an exercise. So how do we get to, to that next level of reading scripture and then listening to God uh, through that? Uh, so we're, asking questions. I think so for me personally, it, it helps when I am in community and we're asking questions about scripture that we're reading um, so that we could start to, to really say, how are we going to obey this? Or how are we going to put this into practice? What are we going to do? What are we learning about God? And God, what do you have to say about this for us? Um, while I'm doing it with others, it's really, it's helped me and propelled me in a place where I could do it by myself. Time logged in. There's no there's no uh, replacement for just logging in time with the scriptures, and I think that the reading of scriptures, um, well, the vast majority of Christians don't read scriptures. Right. <laughs> yeah. Then then the vast majority of the people who do read scriptures usually read a chapter a day to keep the devil away, or they read it to fall asleep at night. And this is just. Yeah. That, that's not that's not it. So you're not going to find God's voice if you are wearing earplugs to keep you from hearing it. Mm. We we just have to log in time with the scriptures, and I recommend reading books in in their entirety and repetitive. And when you do that, there's a there's a voice under the surface that becomes much more um, clear and tangible mm. to you. And when you know that voice, then you know when it's speaking in your ear, when it's whispering uh, in your heart, or when it's coming through a friend or a book that you're reading. Um, once you know God, then you know his voice. Uh, yeah. But the scriptures are clear. If you don't know his voice, you're not his. And yeah. that's it's that important. <laughs> it's that essential. Yeah. And yeah, the sheep will know the shepherd's voice. And, uh, and, you know, that's the, that's the place, you know, even when I'm looking at something like, you know, Luke 10, as Jesus said, I'm going to send you as sheep among wolves. The, the thing that I find comforting in that verse is that we are actually sheep that knows the shepherd's voice. And he, he, as the good shepherd is going to speak, he can actually protect, uh, from the wolves. There's all sorts of things that if we're connected to the shepherd, we're actually going to be all right. Um, and so that's actually comforting, even though it doesn't sound it like it on, on the surface. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, in Matthew 10, he says the same words, um, but uh, it's the third time he uses the analogy of sheep in Matthew 10. Mm. He says they're distressed, downcast sheep without a shepherd, then lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then he says, I'm sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Um, and you have to ask, what's the difference between the sheep that are going on offense to the wolves and those who are victims of the mm-hmm. wolves? And the difference is you have a shepherd. Yeah. Um, but then you have to continue and ask the question, why is Jesus, the great shepherd, sending us to the wolves? Uh, and I don't think I don't think God is uh, embarrassed by us asking those questions. There's a good answer to be found, but it's it's not found in the text. It's found in extra biblical sources. 
um, in the book of, uh, what's it called? Oh yeah. Little red riding hood. Um, <laughs> she's going through the forest and the wolf sees her and runs ahead and eats her grandmother and dresses in drag and waits for her to show up. And when she comes, she says, what a big nose you have all the better to smell you with. What big ears you have all the better to hear you with. What big teeth you have all the better to eat you with. And the wolf eats the little girl. Um, <laughs> we think this is an appropriate story to tell our children at night. Um, but but the, the story is telling us that wolves are better prepared to find lost sheep than you or I. <laughs> and so Jesus, in his search to find the lost sheep, sends us to where the wolves are. If you want to find lost sheep, you have to go wolf hunting. Mm. And the best way to do that, Jesus says in that Matthew text, not in the Luke one, but in Matthew, he says, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Um, mm. The enemy has two weapons that he will yield, wield to try and uh, break us and enslave us. And one of them is deception mm. and the other is uh, temptation. And so the best way to deal with deception is to be as wise as a serpent. The best way to deal with temptation is to be as innocent as a dove. Mm. So we can withstand the attacks of the wolves. I love that passage. Um, yeah. We are, we are, we're not super teenage mutant ninja sheep with special powers, <laughs> but we do have a powerful shepherd and yes. we are to go wolf hunting. Yeah. It's a great, great passage. Yeah, that's so good. And it's good. Let's uh, go wolf hunting. But I think the, the a lot of times, you know, the the typical Christian uh, in America are not spending a lot of time among the wolves, um, and they're not spending time amongst the lost. You know, Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost, and you know, so as we're we're hearing his voice and we're doing what he says, if he came to seek and save the lost. And he says, I'm going to send you out as among, uh, as sheep among wolves. We're going to be propelled into the world to go wolf hunting. And we're going to be propelled to to be the light in the darkness and bring the kingdom of light. Um, what does yeah. it look like to be propelled by Jesus into that? It, it's, it's, not, it's not a grand thing. That it, It's just simply building relationships. The world... Um, will be transformed when we build relationships. It, the, the gospel flies best on the wings of relationships. And the problem is we are in our own little bubble with our own echo chamber, yeah. and we're reinforcing the same point of view over and over again. And then every now and then we lob some, <laughs> some gotcha at the other side without knowing anyone over there, not mm -hmm. having any relationship with anybody. And that's true on both sides. Don't get me wrong. Yep. But um, that's not something Jesus has called us to be about. We need to cross the aisle and build relationships and see people made in the image of God and see the goodness of God within them and call it out. Mm. Uh, not just lob nasty memes at them, yeah. thinking that we're, you know, we're doing something good for God. That's craziness. We need to actually uh, have a meal with somebody, sit across the table mm. over a cup of coffee or tea with them and look in their in the eyes and just pray for them, beg God for their souls. There's nothing magical about that, but it is, it is the way yeah. to bring the kingdom of God to the lost world. Um, it doesn't work by just having another conference or speaking from the stage at church or writing another book to Christians. We, we have to actually go out there and do it. Um, mm. Yeah. I've been weary trying to, trying to mobilize, uh, Christians um, and to actually be in the world um, and it's but there is that hope in there that Jesus did say and command us and said let's obey this by going and making disciples um, and going to the lost um, and there's a, a hope that Jesus can revitalize Christians so that the world can see him and know him and find hope in hopeless situations. Yeah, no doubt. I, I've, uh, I gave 20 years of trying to convince Christians to go out into the world yeah. and make a difference. And, and I, I think in more recent times, I've kind of shifted my focus 
away from that. I really think that now my my focus is on the young nuns and duns, those who have mm. are younger, mm-hmm. um, that are um, that are no longer in a religious institution or they never were. And mm-hmm. that's where I think the, the, the new move of God will be birthed. It'll be a renaissance of faith that will not look like our right. old systems. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my hope. Um, I'm, not, I'm not personally um, given up on the church, but I think there are other people than myself that are better at communicating in that environment yeah. and are doing a better job, and I'll leave it to them. Um, but I'm going to focus on those who are outside of the church. Yeah, and I think, I think you know God is going to move uh, greatly uh, among those outside of the church. I mean, he's there, and yeah. the the nice thing is is that we see that God moves everywhere. That there is a move of the Holy Spirit, and you know, Jesus says that nobody can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And so the father's doing a lot of drawing, um, and it just may not look like uh, institution, but yeah. it is looking like a wooing by the father. And if we actually have eyes to see and ears to hear what the father is doing, we're going to actually see that wooing in places that are unexpected. Um, and so, you know, what are some of the places that you've seen God move uh, in those areas and those people, uh, what is he doing? Yeah, so it's really common for evangelical Christians to look across the aisle at those who are canceling people and cancel culture and the woke and, and critical race theory and all those things and and even socialism and, and see eat nothing but evil. Yeah. And I think that's a mistake. I mm-hmm. think what you're, what you're looking at is young people who want to be a part of something bigger than themselves, yeah. that want to bring, bring truth and justice to the world, that want to be a part of a movement, and um, that are willing to do anything they can to bring this about. I think that is a wonderful thing to see. Mm-hmm. And if, if Jesus redeems that, we are going to change the world. Yeah. So I'm not looking at that uh, with all the alarm that others are. I'm looking at it thinking, you know what, you throw the gospel in this mix and you're going to see an army of people ready to turn the world upside down. Yeah. Um, So that's that's where my hope is right now. Um, And I I, I do, you know, I've kind of always been focused on young people. Um, I became a Christian at, at the university and I kind of never left. Um, <laughs> so it's always been a focus of mine. Um, but uh, in more recent days, it's millennials and Gen Z. That's where I'm putting my, my, uh, my hope for the future. And I, you know, when I look at, at Gen Z, one of the things that I see is a, a very communal culture, um, more so than an individualistic culture that we've been raised in in the West for a long time, um, especially, yeah. you know, coming <clears throat> from a pioneering culture, picking ourselves up by our bootstraps. They're, they care for one another uh, on a, in a communal way, in a family way uh, that I haven't seen before in previous generations. And I think that's, that's a, an aspect of God uh, that uh, can really, uh, the gospel can flow through that and it could be, be redeemed and you could see God in the midst of it. I think so. I think it's, uh, it, it's a very um, important thing. It's kind of um, a reaction against the American dream we once had that was mm. very individualistic, that yeah. was very selfish. And uh, I think you could see I mean, it has its downsides. I, I think the Chinese people are very communal in the way they right. view things and at the detriment of personal health or life. And I think that can be overdone. But I, I, I would suspect it's a balancing. It's a pendulum swing in the States mm-hmm. that's probably uh, welcome because we've been so individualistic and so selfish in, our, yeah. in, in the way we approach things. Such, I mean, we're just designed to be consumers. And if we could have a generation that's less about consuming and more about community, 
that's not a bad thing. Right. And I think that you're articulating that. Um, so I think it, I think this, you know, just like young people are really designed to spread COVID because they don't get very sick. It doesn't slow them down so they can take it anywhere they want to go. Mm. Um, they are also designed to take the gospel in ways that the older generations are not. Mm. Um, so I, I think that God is saying to the church right now, um, mm. focus on certain things, you know, uh, with the lockdowns, he gave us a timeout and he said, yeah. go home family is best found at home and church is mm. family so don't don't come to church become church I and mean, yeah. be better neighbors rather than better attenders yeah but i also think he's telling us through this virus and, the, and all that's going on that the younger generation is pre- primed by him to bring an awakening that we we are long mm. overdue for mm. but I, I don't think it's going to be found in the wineskins of our old institutions so we have to ha- allow for a an expression of faith that is new and fresh and not um, not going to look the same as the old way. And if you're not on board with that, this is going to be seen as a threat, probably. Mm. But it it is going to be like that, I think. I think the only way that that the church is going to be okay with with new wineskins and fresh expressions is if they hold on to Jesus. And make him the anchor in the midst of everything. Um, I think that's the that's the key. Um, and I don't think I think we're actually holding on to other things other than Jesus as our core and our center. Um, we need to get back to that. Yeah, I'm fairly certain that we are going to. So I think the lockdown and the mandates we're facing right now are only a um, foreshadowing of what's coming. So I do think that if we do focus strictly on Jesus and we do see an awakening, especially among young people, then persecution will come more mm. rapidly. More, And it's not going to be like your, your grandparents' persecution if you were in China or something like that. It's going to right. be um, you're not going to need your neighbor or family member to turn you in. Your, your Samsung TV or your phone has already right. turned you in. Yeah. So we are going to have to live a more supernatural life. That's why listening to Jesus doing what he says is so much more important because we're going to, we're going to need miracles to exist and function and fulfill the the Mm. great commission during that time. Mm. So I think, yeah, you're right. Focusing on Jesus, then the the established church can make it, but persecution is going to make it, is going to filter out those who are true and those who are false. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I see that. And, you know, persecution itself has, has led to some multiplication um, and, spread to, you know, led to the gospel expanding and growing in different areas, not just the early church, but even today around the world, we could see persecution and, you know, the gospel is spreading in places where persecution is some of the highest, um, you know, in Central Asia particularly at the moment, uh, there is a huge openness to Jesus, but there is also a huge uh, persecution. Um, And so, you know, what is that hope and what is that thing that we hold on to um, in the midst of difficult and trying times? Um, And so what what is for us, what do you think that uh, you have learned uh, through the pandemic um, and what God is trying to say about life uh, on earth um, and life with him. What have you learned? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's many times when God raises his voice because people haven't been listening. And I yeah. think this is one of those cases when you have a global pandemic like this and it's affecting every nation, every tribe, every language and every government. I think we should pay attention. I think God's saying something. Now, when God sent the 10 plagues to Egypt, um, there, there was an obvious end goal. He wanted his people set free. But this was 10 consecutive mm-hmm. plagues. One, two, three, four. Five. It was exhausting. It destroyed the nation's economy. It, it, it was, oh, must have been horrendous to live through. And yet every single plague 
was obvious to every person who lived in Egypt what it was about. Mm. They knew instantly because every plague was a direct assault against their false religion. Mm. So they worshiped the sun god Ra, and God turned him off for three days. They worshiped the Nile, and God made him bleed. They worshiped the snake god Hapti as their protector, and God consumed them. So every Egyptian knew instantly what the message was, Mm. that your faith Mm -hmm. is in something false, and I'm greater. Mm. They didn't have to have a theologian interpret it for it. I think with the COVID crisis, there is a message embedded in it for all Christians, all those who are followers of Christ, and we have all learned this lesson, and we don't even realize that it's universal. So basically, God has been training us for two years about the viral spread uh, of the gospel. All we have to do is take everything we've been taught and reverse it. Mm. If Jesus is a contagion, if Jesus is a good virus that spreads and transforms life and culture and nations, then all we have to do is stop social distancing, stop wearing masks, don't be asymptomatic. don't inoculate yourself with just a little bit of Jesus and a lot of other stuff uh, so that you begin build a resistance to Jesus. Um, let him take over all of your life. Um, mm. Don't rely on essential workers. Everyone's an essential worker. Mm. So if we actually adopted spiritually everything that we've learned from COVID and mm. just reversed it, we could spread the kingdom of God like a virus. The truth is we don't need all that training on how to not spread the virus because the gospel <laughs> is a virus and we have contained it very well yeah. for decades now. And we're very good at that. Yeah. What we need to do is reverse it and start to see it spread like a contagious fire. And that's what the book that's what this new book viral is about. It's about what God is saying and how we can learn from that. Mm. Yeah. So how do we how do we let the gospel out of the box? Um <laughs> well, uh, one one of the things that's important is we have to we have to value the gospel. The truth is that um, if we truly value it, we would tell people about it. You know, when if you're from Atlanta, right. you're telling the whole world about your team right now. Mm-hmm. You're excited about them. You're not shy about it because you value it. But for some reason, when it comes to the gospel, we get embarrassed, we get ashamed, we start to hold back. That just means we don't value yeah. what we actually have. So we need to get in touch with the beautiful gift we have that's within us, that is that is real, that is tangible. Because frankly, if we don't believe in it, then why would we spread it? And mm-hmm. why would anybody want to receive it yeah. if we don't our, ourselves don't even believe in it? Yeah. So that's the first step. Um, Secondly, we need to uh, uh, we need to start being more relational with people. The way we approach the gospel is typically event oriented, mm-hmm. and it you know there's a reason why we have made church a non relational event where you look at the back of someone's head for mm-hmm. an hour or so and then you go home and you don't actually interact with people. Satan has been trying to steal the gospel from relationships and make it just an event that you Mm. are a participant in, a consumer of. That needs to change. We need to be building relationships outside of the church, in our neighborhoods, and and at the place of work, and on our campuses, and be authentic, be bold, but not offensive. And, um, you know, Jesus spelled out so clearly in the passages we already looked at, Matthew 10 and Luke 10, mm-hmm. how to bring the gospel as a contagion. He, uh, it's clear that, that he sees it as a viral thing, and it needs to spread virally from person to person. And we've done everything we can to hold it back. So when someone comes to faith in Christ, what we typically do is extract them from right. the very place where he could be a contagion, or she, and remove all the influence that they would have that would be viral, that would spread. We need to stop doing mm-hmm. that. Um, stop taking them out of their context and plugging them into ours and start letting the gospel spread from relationship to relationship within their community, within their and, and go from community to community. 
those are the things Jesus taught in Luke 10 and Matthew 10 that are very practical, yeah, very real. They're all right there. They've been there all along, and we just have neglected them. Yeah. Um, one of the things you mentioned uh, in your book, uh, Viral, is the that the word offices are not found in the Greek text when it comes to to gifts or so we're actually looking more of a of a flat leadership or something different than an office of of leadership can you expand on that a little bit for us yeah so um in the world you do have hierarchies it's just real uh you can't you can't deny it um but jesus did say it's not to be that way among you that the greatest is the least and the um, the first is the last, the humble are exalted, and the exalted are humbled, and he, he, he flattens the hierarchy down so that it's basically Jesus and then all of us. Mm, mm, yeah. <laughs> and so what I, the language I like to use is lateral leadership instead of vertical. Mm. So um, instead of having accountability up or down, yeah. we have one another's, and that's the way the New Testament <laughs> describes it. So... Um, you know, the, the translators of the New Testament, they put their bias into the text because they couldn't imagine Christianity without the hierarchy. Mm. That's why you have in First Timothy 3, 1, you know, anyone aspires to the office of overseer is a good thing. Well, there, there's no word office there. They're putting mm. that in. Or in Hebrews, where it says uh, we're to respect those who rule over us. Well, that that's not the wow. actual language. That's a That's a translation that is not accurate. The actual language is the one who goes before. Mm. So if you think of it more, leadership is more like we're all on a path to Jesus. And there's some who are further along, we're following in their steps. And the moment they veer off the path, we we stop following them. Mm. Uh, we just go straight to Jesus. Um, and there are some people further along than others, and there are people behind us that can learn from us. And that makes us all on a level playing field mm that there is no one more important than another. We're all following Jesus. It, it doesn't eliminate leadership. In fact, in my understanding, it makes leadership even more important that the pioneers who've gone first, they can show us the path. They can show us where the, the rocks are not sound. Yeah. Don't step there. Um, watch out for that. And, uh, without, and it empowers everyone. So we're not, having a few people empowered and the rest of us are just mm. consumers of their power. I don't yeah. think that's the way it's meant to be. Each and every one of us is essential worker. So um, that that's, that's my view of what Jesus is teaching mm. in the gospels. I think yeah. it's very clear. There are like three or four times when Jesus compares good leadership with bad leadership and he uses two very distinct prop- prepositions. The bad leadership are always over. Yep. And mm. the good leadership is always among us. Mm. And so when it comes to, to the way we interact as church, uh, it's the one another's that come to yeah. mind. So we're to teach one another. We're to bear one another's burdens. We're to uh, confess sins to one another. Mm. We don't need to have a leader that does the work for us. We're to all do it. And I think that this is the kind of faith that needs to take fire uh, and start to spread um, because it's uh, but it's been contained by this hierarchical system that isn't yeah. going to ever accomplish what Jesus wants. So we have to abandon the old systems if we want to be part of the new birth. Mm. That's beautiful. I mean, there's almost, you know, 61 and other commands in the New Testament. I mean, it's a lot of one and others, right? Uh, and it's not just a one off. It's not a just, OK, I give you a new command, love one another. It is, like you said, teach one another, admonish one another, greet one another with a holy kiss, which we don't really do in America. But, you know, when I lived in the Middle East, we did all the time. Um, so we have to, you know, figure out what it is to do this. And so how do we do church? You know, one of the one things that I love is uh, Ephesians 4. Um, and when Jesus is giving, you know, those gifts to the body of Christ, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. But in verse 7, it says, and grace was given to each one of us. Um, that means that everybody has a part to play and everybody's been given something. Um, and 
it's not just for you know the solo leader to have an office of apostle. Um, it's everybody has these gifts. So how do we get to this place of one anothering and then everybody with their individual gifts playing their part so that we could grow up into maturity, that we could actually look like Jesus? Yeah. So it's it's interesting language there, actually. It's to each and every one of us would be probably a better translation mm. of that verse in verse 7. To each and every one of us, this grace was given. So the gift is given to every one of us. That's where it starts. You have to understand the, the real gift of Ephesians is not just apostolic or prophetic or teaching. It's Jesus. Yeah. He is the gift. And if you have Jesus, you have everything you need. You no longer have the excuse to say, you know, I'm I'm not gifted in that area. You yeah. have Jesus. You have all you need to live godly in Christ Jesus. As he starts the whole book off with, blessed be the God and Father who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. <laughs> that plus my book and you should be fine, right? No. <laughs> you have everything you need. You've got it all. So if each and every one of us taps into this idea that latent within us is Jesus, <laughs> You have everything you need. There's nothing you're lacking. Um, I think that's the important starting place. Yeah. Um, then uh, there are gifts given to the church that are persons that are gifted to the church for the purpose of equipping us to know our own role and to fulfill that role. Mm -hmm. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as shepherds and teachers for the equipping of the saints. Yep. for the work of ministry or service. So the evangelist isn't called to reach lost people for Christ. According to the text, the evangelist is called to equip the saints to reach lost people for Christ. <laughs> now, the truth is you'll never stop an evangelist from winning people right. for Christ. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about that. But their actual calling, once they are a mature evangelist, is to train others to do it. Mm. So if you take that further, the teacher isn't called to teach the saints, but to train the ch saints to teach. And yeah. we have, everywhere I go, I ask people, does the Bible tell us that we all should teach? And they immediately do this because they've mm -hmm. been trained by teachers for decades that no, only teachers teach, which is all just for job security. The truth is there's many verses, you know, we already mentioned, uh, when you assemble together, 1 Corinthians 14, each one has a teaching. You get to Colossians 3.16, when the word of God richly dwells within you, you will be teaching one another. When you get to, uh, um, I mean, you, you could start with the Great Commission. Everyone has been given yeah. the Great Commission to teach one another, teach them to obey all that I commanded you. And if that's not enough, the writer of Hebrews <laughs> says, by now you all ought to be teachers. <laughs> but he says, all you can handle is milk. So I ask the question often, what is milk? Milk is nothing more than a pre-digested meal. <laughs> the mother eats a meal, the body absorbs the nutrients, and it comes out to the baby as milk. And that is what a sermon is. Mm. A sermon is a pre-digested meal. <laughs> uh, and we, our churches, are full of milkaholics, mm. lactose-dependent people who cannot hear from God directly, they have to receive it through somebody else's pre-digested yeah. uh, meal. Mm. So I think we need to shift and change. So now the teacher is not called to teach the saints, but to train them to teach. Mm. And that's the only way you can turn it inside out. And now everyone's empowered. Everyone yeah. is spreading. And you and I have taught, Joshua, we know that when you teach, you learn exponentially more than the people who are hearing you teach. Oh, yeah. If you want the people in your church to, to learn, get them to teach. Yeah. Uh, we would be far better off if we saw the gifts this way. The, the role of leadership in the church is not to put good stuff in people, but to get the God stuff out of them. <laughs> and that's a whole different approach. Uh, and that's what I think Ephesians is all about. Wow, that's good. I want to hear that again. The The role of leaders in the church is not to put good stuff in you, but to get God's stuff out of them, right? That's so good um, to to hear that. Yeah, anything like, you would put in people, it doesn't compare in any way to what Jesus has already put in them. Uh, yes. So let's just stop that game. <laughs> let's just realize 
that what I have to give you is nothing compared to Jesus. Mm. I'm going to stop trying to give you what I have, and I'm going to try and get the God stuff out of you for the Mm. rest of the world. That's just a whole, that's a dramatic shift that needs to take place. Mm. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, you didn't. That's that's exactly what we want to hear, is that's a big shift. But I think part of that shift is asking good questions of pulling things out. Um, and that's a, that's a different skill set than we're used to in the church, isn't it? Yeah. Like we we don't have that skill set, so we need others to equip us. And like, how do we facilitate that getting God stuff out of people? Um, do you have any ideas of how to do that? <laughs> well, yeah, you you hit on it. Basically, asking good questions. The the person who asks the most questions in the Bible is the one who has all the answers. <laughs> and there's a yeah. reason why God asks so many questions. It's because uh, self-discovered truth is a deeper form of learning than just receiving truth that somebody else figured out. Yeah. And when we only receive other people's thoughts, it radicalizes us because it's not a part of our story. Mm-hmm. It's not a part of our our um, our autobiographical memory is just yeah. facts. And we begin to fight over facts without any kind of empathy or understanding of where those facts came from. Mm. So I think uh, we really need to produce learners. So when it comes to training people, I suggest we try to, uh, de- we need to develop learning systems instead of teaching curriculum. And there's two very different things. Mm-hmm. If your aim is to produce learners, then maybe just teaching them facts is not the way to go. Maybe you need to help them discover truth and pass that truth on. Hmm. And they will learn it on a far deeper level than if they just mimic what I had to say. Hmm. Um, And so our whole approach to teaching needs to shift and change and stop being just about um, conveying my thoughts but helping you discover God's thoughts. And those are two very different approaches. In fact, uh, self-discovery takes the burden off the shoulders of the experts and says, listen, this is your lifelong learning process. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to teach people what to think, we need to start showing them how to think. Mm -hmm. But this is this is the, the pandemic that's hit all of us. Yeah. It, it's that that nobody can think for themselves. We've all been radicalized because we've been told and it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on. We're all radicalized. Yeah. We're all just parroting words that somebody else came up with without d- digging deeper and thinking about it. And so uh, we're becoming dumber and mm. more committed to that dumbness with every day uh it's it's really foolish Um, we need to actually learn to think a little deeper and it could start with us we could mentor people to think and for themselves and and to find answers instead instead of giving them answers we help them find the answers Mm. that's a different approach yeah so create some learning systems to figure out how people can can learn have you seen, or do you, are, do you have good examples of that, it, to a learning system for discipleship uh, in Christ? Well, just a little bit, what does that look like? So we use something called life transformation groups. It's mm-hmm. a group of two or three that meet together once a week for about an hour. Uh, men meet with men, women with women, because we're going to do three things. We're going to choose a book of the Bible that we're all going to read throughout the week on our own, but mm-hmm. we're going to read... 30 chapters of scripture. And uh, when we get together, if one of us didn't finish that reading, we read it again the next week. So there's repetition. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading Hebrews twice a week, and this is going to be, I think, the sixth week. So I'm learning a lot from (laughs) Hebrews. Um, It's a simple way to to build on this idea that I'm hearing God's voice. Mm, I'm making sense of of a letter that I've read a number of times, but I'm seeing it in context mm. and I'm getting it repetition. It's, you know, you'd be surprised what you can learn from Romans if you read it eight times instead of once. Yeah. <laughs> so it yeah. just starts to make more sense. Mm. So that that's our Bible reading. We also confess our sins to one another. Mm. Uh, we have a list of questions that anyone can answer and we all answer, we all, mm. anyone can ask and we all answer them honestly. And it's just a chance to bring to light any shadow that clings to our soul yeah. from the week. And it's gone. 
It has no hold on us. <laughs> then the third thing we do is we identify the names of people that aren't followers of Christ that we want to pray for. And we have a, a list of prayers for them and we all pray for them. Now, the beauty of this system is that it is simple. Anyone can do it. You don't need to have a discipleship group leader because yeah. there's no leadership needed. And uh, it it encourages self-discovery in the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Instead of giving a Bible study with fill in the blanks, yeah. it's letting you just consume scripture repetitively and in context. And pretty soon, you know, you have an anointing from God. You have the author living inside of you. I think that if you don't take that fact into consideration as a teacher, then you're missing everything. Yes. <laughs> but if you realize that every student in your class is full of the author, then mm. maybe you want to point them to the author instead of to your ideas. Mm. That's and good. that's what this does. So this is a great foundation for growth, spiritual development. It doesn't, it's not leader dependent um it is a great immune system for heresy because if someone says you know i think this is saying i'm god the other two people say i didn't get that yeah. and you you cut off heresy right at the right at the start mm. um and it multiplies rapidly yeah. um it's something that anyone can do so that's our discipleship system there are other good systems available this is not the only way we know that but this has been a proven way that's worked all over the mm. world uh, life transformation groups and it becomes a very sound foundation to build everything else upon because it plants the DNA of divine truth, nurturing relationship, apostolic mission in the smallest unit of church life. Yeah. So the DNA is in the, every cell. So whatever you build beyond that, it has the DNA within. And yeah. So that's very important. That's so good. Uh, where can people find that? Um, well, let's see. There's uh, our, My website is starling like the bird starling mm. initiatives.com there you can find ltg cards this is one version we have we have a, three or four versions and then uh, there's a book available called cultivating a life for god mm. it is about life transformation groups there is another book called ordinary hero that's also available mm. uh, on amazon that, that talks mm-hmm. about it so uh, you'd be amazed how many books I had to write on this simple idea. <laughs> <laughs> and it helps you learn, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Each one is a learning experience and they're all available out there. So, um, and it's very easy to get this started. You just have to find someone who's drowning and say, Hey, maybe this will help. Let's, yeah. It'll help me. Maybe it'll help you. It's mutual discipleship. We're not confessing to a a priest we're confessing to one another yeah and we're sharing the burden and we're learning together hmm. uh, but imagine though everything that follows from that if you build disciples this way and they're all learners and they're all hearing god's voice and they're all clean and forgiven and healed then everything you do with that building block is going to be healthier yeah uh, and and so that's that's a good place to start yeah that's great. I've uh, just two questions uh, here at the end. One, if you could go back to your 21-year-old self, what advice would you give? Hmm. I would tell the 21-year-old, I would tell myself <laughs> this, but I guarantee you myself would not hear what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Slow down. You don't have to be in a hurry. Mm. It'll all come to you. Uh, when I was in my 20s, I was in a hurry to be in my 30s, and <laughs> I just wanted to grow up too fast, and I I missed some of the joy mm. of being young. Um, I would tell myself to enjoy a little bit, bit more. I don't know that I would have heard that counsel. Right. <laughs> and, but, yeah. yeah. But I think that's such great advice, though. And I think if you, know, if you are a young person hearing this, slow down and enjoy uh, your life. Uh, more and enjoy being young. <laughs> it's very true. Um, anything uh, besides uh, viral, uh, your new book, anything that you've been reading lately or watching lately that you could recommend? Yeah, let's see. Um, uh, no. Um, let's see. Well, I'm reading a book right now. John McWhorton's new book called Woke Racism. It's not bad. It's uh, interesting. 
I do, I hate it when um, the the public narrative doesn't allow for people to have differing opinions. Hmm. So if you if you don't have the same opinion, you're instantly <laughs> classified in a in a comical way and just in an unrespectful hmm. way. So this is a good book. Um, I get. I have found that public media is not worth watching. It's all propaganda. It's all deceptive. And uh, so I, I have begun to find my information from independent journalists on YouTube, which doesn't sound credible, but trust me, it's more credible if you find the right ones. Mm. So um, that's been where I've been getting more of my information from. Um, and that's been helpful. Mm. Uh, you just can't trust what you're getting on right. Fox or MSNBC <laughs> or CNN uh, or any of those others. Yep. It's just not, yeah, you're just being sold. You're just being played if that's where you get your information. From. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, so how can people find uh, your book? Yeah. So it's available on Amazon. Uh, Amazon, go there and get it. Uh, or... You know, viral is actually the follow-up to the book Prey. And so we are about to make an offer on our own website, starlinginitiatives.com, where if you buy viral, you get Prey for free as a paperback. So you get two for the price of one. Um, but if, if you need it right away, uh, the best place to go is Amazon. Yeah, that'd be good. But we'll point people to Starling Initiatives. I'm sure there's... That's uh, a little more helpful for you as well to get people to go there uh, to your site. So, uh, Neil, I just uh, want to thank you. It was, uh, you know, inspiring to me. And, uh, you know, as you were sharing, the one thing that uh, I got from this is more of Jesus, that I actually have uh, Jesus in me uh, and and who he is lives with me and I can actually start to become more like him and I look like him uh, in every facet in different ways. And so thank you for that. Um, and it's uh, it helped me, uh, yeah, follow Jesus a little closer. So thank you. Yeah. Listen to Jesus and do what he says. Amen. Amen.